here we go. We are really happy to be welcoming uh, Brooke DiGiovanni Evans, the Interim Director of Learning at the MFA and Poet Reggie Gibson today. So thank you both so much for talking to us about Poetry in the Galleries, which is, yeah. of course, a major favorite of mine. And we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Now, before yeah. we get started, we just want to give everybody a chance to type in the chat window and um, let us know who you are and where you're listening from and if you are having any trouble with the audio. But if you can hear us just fine, then awesome. Um, so please go ahead and say hello. Mm -hmm. Hello. Looks like we've got about 19 or 20 people so far, which is awesome. And please feel free to go ahead and keep introducing yourself and I will turn it over to Brooke and Reggie. Thank you so much. Sure. Great. Thanks, Meg. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna try and share my screen here. All right, can everybody see that? Not yet. Not, not now, now I can. Okay. I see it says New England Museum Association. No. <laughs> All right, let me try again. Share screen. Share. That worked. Okay. All right. Yep. Everyone can see MFA Boston? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Yay, technology. <laughs> when it works. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to do one more thing. Okay, great. Um, so it's wonderful to be here today. Um, and I want to thank Nima and Meg for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite recent programs. Um, and also glad to be here with Reggie, um, who is an amazing partner in this project. So thank you too for joining us, Reggie. Um, just as a quick intro to me, um, I have two jobs currently. I am the Interim Director of Learning, so I oversee the Education Department at the MFA, um, and I'm also the Head of Gallery Learning, um, which entails designing programs for all ages in the galleries with my staff. Uh, we have about 70 programs a month um, that we oversee. And I'm also on the board uh, for NEMA, so um, lots of different hats that, that I enjoy wearing. <laughs> um, all right, so I thought I would start by sharing this great quote from a participant, uh, which is, I have never thought about art this deeply. I connected with art deeper than ever before. Um, this quote and many others that we collected from from visitors really demonstrated the success of this program to me and showed that we had accomplished one of the goals we set out for the program, which was really to slow people down and connect them with art. So to give you a little bit of background on how this whole program started, um, it started as part of our strategic plan, which we're currently in and moving towards the end of. And one of the goals of the strategic plan was to enliven the galleries. Um, so my colleague, Kristen Hoskins, who is a director of programs here, were sort of given this charge and um, given some internal funding. And we had a lot of discussions on, do we want to expand existing programs? Do we want to create new ones? And we sort of hit upon this idea of using this funding to connect with artists and art organizations to bring new voices into the galleries. <clears throat> So with this internal funding, we created um, what as an umbrella term is called the creative residency, which is where poetry in the galleries falls. Um, so I had always wanted to do poetry in the galleries. And since I had the idea, um, I kicked off the creative residency um, with the program. And for the program, we partnered with Mass Poetry. Um, so Sarah Siegel, who was at Mass Poetry at the time and I worked together, we brainstormed ideas. Um, she shared examples of other museums that she's worked with. They've worked with the Peabody Essex Museum, they've worked with the Gardner. Um, and together we developed this program. 
based and then based on the goals and sort of the format that that we came up with um, Sarah selected the poets to invite to join the, the program and so our three poets are pictured on the screen um, Reggie Kathy and Kristen and really this program would not have been possible without mass poetry and without the great work of these three poets um, they really made it excel um, that partnership was key so our goals for the program were to collaborate with local artists and arts organizations to enliven the galleries, as I mentioned before, to engage, uh, for this one in particular, engage with art through writing and creative expression, and to get visitors to really focus on close looking and attention to detail, really um, trying to slow down the visitor, and then also to welcome in new audiences. So to give you kind of a little bit of a, 411 on the information on the program. Um, it was every Wednesday night and we chose Wednesday night because it's a free night at the museum and so we wanted everyone to be able to participate who wanted to. The program ran for two hours from 6.30 to 8.30 and it was drop-in and free. People didn't have to sign up ahead of time, they didn't have to purchase any tickets, um, they could just wander through the galleries and grab a stool and participate. Uh, it was designed for all ages and um, the format was kind of similar to an existing program that we had called Drawing in the Galleries, which is a very long running program on Wednesday nights where people go to sketch in the museum um, and we provide all the materials for them. So I mentioned we picked a two hour time slot and, and kind of thinking about other programs like Drawing in the Galleries, we sort of expected people to stay for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, what Reggie and I discovered <laughs> pleasantly on the first night was that people stayed for almost the entire two hours, um, which was just great to see how, how engaged everyone was. For the um, exhibitions that we highlighted, we decided to focus on special exhibitions uh, for people's inspiration for creating their poetry because we thought that might be a draw for people um, coming to see a pastel exhibition or a contemporary artist. And we could also piggyback on some of the marketing that those exhibitions get as well. We had one education staff person, Emily Auchincloss, who worked the program every night. She would introduce the program, um, help the visitors, help the poets, and then she also provided feedback on what went well and what to improve from week to week. Um, and Reggie will talk about this in a little bit, but the curriculum was really designed by the poets. Um, we sort of gave them the loose format, told them what to expect in terms of um, the visitors and, and the exhibitions and then just let them run with um, whatever ideas they felt were um, best for connecting poetry to those exhibitions. So these are the special exhibitions that we highlighted. Our French Pastels exhibition, um, Klaus Oldenburg, which is, uh, is a contemporary artist, um, and then also Cecilia Vicuna, another contemporary artist who was creating an installation inspired by um, ancient writing. Each poet had one exhibition to work with. Reggie worked with French pastels and they were in that exhibition for the entire month. So they were in there every single Wednesday in September, October, and November. <clears throat> So once we had the logistics down, we focused on really getting the word out. We relied heavily on mass poetry to reach out to their networks because they were obviously tapped into the poetry scene that we were not. We used a lot of online marketing, um, Facebook posts, website um, information, emails to members. We also played around with some creative ideas um, and did something called Raining Poetry, which you can see on the left part of the screen there. We asked each of the poets to write a poem that we then created in a stencil um, and used a special um, material that when it's when it's not wet it's completely invisible but then when you get it wet it appears um, and so it was kind of a fun marketing tool that we did both um, within the courtyard of the museum um, and then also outside um, on the front sidewalk also during the program, Mass Poetry collected poems every week from visitors and posted them on their website um, for, to kind of continue to um, engage interest in the program. 
So connected to that, this slide sort of shows how people discover the program. Um, so kind of a range, Mass Poetry Outreach and MFA um, website were um, about similar, about 17%. Uh, one critique that we did get when we did evaluations of the program is that um, it it was hard for people to find out that it was happening. Um, so if I repeated it again, I think I would definitely, um, you know, ask the poets to do even more outreach and then just do kind of general outreach overall, because um, that was sort of the one complaint that we get, we got. Um, but we noticed over the course of the program, the numbers did really surge so that we had about 50 people um, almost every night towards the end of the program. Um, but a lot of that was due to word of mouth and due to uh, repeat people coming to the program over and over again. One of the lovely things that was created by the program was sort of this community of folks that would come every time. Uh, we even had folks drive down from Vermont to participate. Um, teachers brought their students, parents brought their older children, um, and we had a lot of repeat visitors, as you'll see later, about 35% of uh, people we surveyed came back multiple times. Um, so that it really um, gained a lot of momentum over time, which is great to see. So as I mentioned, we did do surveys. Um, every night we gave people a short questionnaire um, and asked them to answer about 10 questions. Um, the questionnaire was administered by one of our staff. And we collected 176 surveys overall, which was about 50% of the people in attendance. We had um, 351 people participate over the three months. As I mentioned, 35% attended more than one session, which is great to see. Um, and also the ages of the participants uh, was very wide ranging, as you see from 12 to 83. Um, and the number that I thought was especially great is that 66% uh, were in their teens and 20s. So it was really reaching out to a, a younger audience, which was wonderful. Um, 77% were not members. That's actually not really a very surprising number because it's um, our free night. So we tend to get a smaller member audience on the free night. Um, but it was also a number that we were happy to see because one of the goals of the program was really to engage new audiences. <clears throat> We collected um, audience demographics on the group, and this slide just gives you a sense of who participated. I think most notable was that our audience was pretty diverse, um, as opposed to our the general sort of demographics for the MFA. Um, we also got a lot of people attending locally, um, which is again not surprising um, for a drop-in program. But we did get a, you know a few people coming from other countries as well, which was great to see. We asked people why they came to the program. Um, most, as you can see from this slide, came to the workshop because they enjoyed poetry um, and looking at art. 50% were poets, but 15% had never written a poem prior to the workshop. Um, so that was great to see engaging kind of new poets in our um, program. And a, a large draw that doesn't show up on this slide, but was the interactive nature of the program. People really enjoyed um, getting to write poetry together, read poetry together, work with the poets. Um, and so that was, was cited many times as a reason why people came to the program and kept coming back. I pulled a couple of quotes. Um, one thing that we asked participants is if they had experienced art differently because of the program. Um, and we were pleasantly surprised that there were several comments um, about that. Many people mentioned looking more closely at details more than usual, kind of similar to that first quote that I read. Um, other people talked about the, again, the interactive nature and um, how it's very personal and also non-judgmental non space. Um, as I mentioned, a, a real community started to grow up around the program uh, with several people actually discussing at the end sort of how sad they were that it was ending and, and talking about maybe forming a group um, to continue meeting with each other even after the program finished. And then other folks talked about just the opportunity to try something new, um, again, in sort of a safe space uh, with not a lot of commitment. It was, you know, they could stay for as long as they wanted and participate however they wanted. Um, and so it, it allowed people to, to try something that they may not have done before. 
We also asked the poets to uh, reflect on their time after they finished each month. And um, this allowed us again to gather additional feedback, which was really helpful uh, for the program overall. But we also shared that feedback with people's permission um, with the next poet so that they had a sense of what the poet before them had experienced, what were the rewards, what were the challenges. Um, and related to that, we also encourage people to come to attend each other's sessions. So they really got a sense of the dynamic of the program so that when it was their turn um, to lead the program, they, they had a, a fuller picture of what it looked like. So one of our poets, Kristen Hill, um, shared these thoughts that um, I thought were really helpful to pass on. Some of the positives that she found is that it really increased people's comfort in the museum. It made uh, the museum sort of feel like their own. People were on the floor, people were sitting in the corners, um, you know, they were sitting in front of their favorite pieces. Um, it really felt like their space. And then, as I mentioned earlier, also the fact that uh, people stayed for a really long time. Um, we were sort of expecting to start, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, but a lot of people stayed for that entire two hours. Some of the challenges were um, the number of people that <laughs> appeared, especially for Kristen, she was towards the end. So she had um, you know, around 50 people almost every time. And there was no limit. It was drop-in, uh, not ticketed. So whoever came <laughs> was welcomed into the program. And uh, if it got crowded, it got crowded. And we just kind of worked with it. Um, also the fact that you're in a gallery space. Um, you know, this is something that was new, I think, to some of the poets, that you're not working in a classroom, you're not working in a, a space that's a little bit more controlled. Um, and so um, for Kristen especially, she was in a very dark gallery, there was sound playing at the same time. Um, there's just the general sort of sound interruptions of being in a public space. We didn't close off the galleries that, that these programs took to part in, so there are people coming in and out. Um, so that, you know, that could be sort of a distraction and, and that was um, something that, that she had to work through um, as an artist in the space. So our creative residencies continued after Poetry in the Galleries. Uh, we did Dance in the Galleries um, in the spring of 2019, focused on the Ansel Adam exhibition. Um, I worked with Improv Boston to do um, improv sketches in the galleries in um, last fall, 2019. And, and that, again, was very interactive, really inviting visitors up um, to participate in the sketches. Um, the two people with the ties are from Improv Boston in this picture, but the rest are visitors um, who are participating in, in a sketch in one of our exhibitions. Um, we invited po and, uh, Reggie back uh, for Poetry in the Galleries and um, also last fall um, to engage with our Nubia Now exhibition, which he'll discuss in a moment. And then we'll finish out the creative residency series because um, our strategic plan is ending, so our, our funding is going away um, with music in the galleries, um, which will feature a live DJ during our upcoming um, Basquiat exhibition that will open in a couple of months. Um, we were also able to include this program in some other events throughout the year. Um, Reggie performed in our late nights. Um, and so the program not only took place sort of in its time slot on Wednesday nights, but we were able to, um, to do it on other nights as well, because um, it was such a success and, and people really um, engaged with it and, and were excited about it. So I will turn it over to Reggie now um, to talk about his perspective as a visiting artist. Sure. Thank you. Let me see if I can get us moving here. Uh, are you out now? I'm out. It's all yours. <laughs> all right. So we'll try this. And this. Uh, everyone see all of that? Can you see all of that? Yep. All right. Um. What I'll do uh, first off is maybe start off with this quick video clip of um, French Pastel's Treasures from the Vault. This is what the MFA put out itself uh, for, for advertising. And also it'll give you a, a, an understanding of sort of what the um, gallery was like. Can you hear this, Brooke? Thank you. 
Yes. So what I thought was, was um, as an artist, what I appreciated was that the MFA did its best to help us to also advertise, although some of it wasn't um, what Brooke said, maybe could have done a little bit more, but I really do appreciate, appreciate this because it gives people, gave people an idea of what is going on and also uh, what they can expect when they walk into the space. And I thought this, this video was pretty well done. When I walk into... I treated my time at the MFA as I would uh, a performance or what I'm doing something in classrooms. I'm always thinking that my, I'm trying to get across five things. And I think the museum is also trying to get across these same five things. And let me see if I can get you out of that. And one of them is this. I always think about how do we engage, that is how do we get them, get the attention, entertain, how do we keep them, keep their attention, keep them looking at something, affect, just how we move them, make them feel something, educate, what have they learned, and how do we elevate, how do we lift them? And so for me in a performance, and I think also with the MFA, my thought was, was that um, we're trying to get uh, audiences to divert their attention away from their phones and from, and from other things as well, so they can be prepared for an extraordinary experience, which is what is what the museums can give them. And then to keep them there, we didn't want to just use um, gimmicks for gimmick's sake, but there were some things that we wanted folks to to pay ex uh, a lot of attention to. And one of the thing, one of the gimmicks I would say that that I uh, came up with was to tell everyone that if we're going to be writing that what they're going to be writing is also going to be part of a collective poem. And this allowed them to be able to look more deeply at the work. And we'll go into that in, in a minute. The effect came in when people, I saw how they engaged directly with the art itself. And in speaking with, with people, finding out how they actually felt about it and how it moved them. And I'll mention one of those that was extraordinarily moving for me uh, as we move on. The um, Education was about what uh, did they learn something new? That question was also asked, what have you learned about this painting? What have you learned about pastels? What is it that you understand now about art? And people would be able to tell me what that was. And then the elevation of it was the understanding that, that they couldn't look at art anymore the same way as they had previously done. So it was not something that was going to be throwaway anymore. So this is how I began things, as, as it would have been in a classroom. This photo, this photo shows me beginning to speak about ekphrasis and explain what ekphrasis is. And um, ekphrasis is a, descript, is a descriptive writing about, to, or from the perspective of a work of art. And what I did was I gave what I understood to be my first vivid um, connection to egg phrases, which was when I was a small child and I told them this. And they also talked about what they connected to as well when they didn't know what it was called, that it was art that was moving them. Then I took them through a series of exercises and here is the first exercise that's in four parts. Um, my assumption was that some people knew about art and others didn't. My assumption was, was that they would be sort of mixed. So the first thing I did was I had them talk about to go to the paintings themselves and start listing objective information. And that is what they saw directly in the artwork. Use nouns and use adjectives. Don't color anything yet. Just go by directly what it is you objectively understand is in the artwork. And they created a list of, in, with, in which they did that of objective information. The second thing was the subjective information. What actions, moods, or feelings do you associate with this artwork, with, with what it is that you're seeing? And they had another list of subjective information. The third list was inferential information, which is the sound, smells, taste that they associate with the artwork, use their physical senses other than the visual and to make it up if need be. What do they infer from what's going on? Afterwards, we took information from those three categories, put them into one category, put them into one piece of work, which was using as much of that info that they gathered to make a simple description or story of what they see, seen and sensed in the artwork. So after that, brought people back and we, so when they went through, they went of course through looking at some of the works that we had here and these were fairly popular. And once they had written everything, we had folks come back and share. And that was a very important thing to actually share what it was that was going on and have people connect to it. Um, when all of the, the workshops were done, and I'm gonna share one with you uh, later. When all of the workshops were done, 
um, all of the writing, what happened is we had each of the students go to, who volunteered to go to a piece of artwork and become the teacher. Show us what it was that they explored within this piece of work while reading a finished poem that they had written, they had been led to. And so this is one young lady who's doing uh, this, this piece. Here's another young lady doing another one. Here's, a, here's a, uh, an older man who I know doing another one. And here's one that, that um, was very, very popular, of course, uh, uh, Millet's Farmyard by Midnight. And many people commented on, on this one. Now with this one in particular, um, this, this sets us up for a second exercise that I had led them through, which was something I call descriptive eyeglasses. So uh, description eyeglasses, like prescription eyeglasses, but description eyeglasses. And so this is one, this is that exercise, and I'll just read it quickly. Very often brief descriptions museums uh, provide about a painting contain information that can be helpful in understanding it sometimes. Perhaps there is even a poem being communicated to us through that description. Finding this poem can help us see the painting differently and more clearly. So leading them through these three categories where they find a, found a pastel that they thought had a good description of the artwork and this is one from that was from the MFA I uh, can't really see this here this was met from the MFA and it says emptiness and silence pervade the shadowy yard in this strikingly large work describing similar nighttime scenes Malay wanted viewers to feel the splendors and terrors of the night hear the chance the silences the rustling of the air to make them perceive the infinite a full moon cast an eerie glow creating that mystical and perhaps even menacing atmosphere deep in shadow a black cat climbs the ladder leaning against the building at the left and then next was was to uh, actually let me go back so you can actually see see this and then next after they looked at that which is very interesting because the descriptions which many of them had said that they don't really uh, look at because they like to have their own um, connection to the artwork was interesting that when that description was read everyone looked over at the at the uh, painting again to see that they had missed the cat which is right up here toward toward the left after that they wrote down uh, nouns and phrases of no more than three words from a description and then we let them after they had written those downs and phrases and words let them to their own and this is one that I came up with and it was silence. Well, actually, I'll let you look at that. Silence, shadow, splendor, the chance of the infinite moon, mystical, menacing, the full night is a black cat leaning. So it was to get a sort of haiku sort of uh, exploration of a piece of artwork. And it was really, really popular. So we led them through two others, um, one which was about a small, uh, portrait writing exercise and then we expanded upon that portrait writing exercise and we also I gave them a fifth one which they can go home with they could go to other galleries with so that we could continue the learning afterwards it was very important that they went home with something this one right here this this painting uh, was um, extraordinarily powerful uh, this is um, uh, dance and rose this is uh, from um, I'm blanking right now. Who is this from again? This is from... Is it Degas? It's a Degas. Thank you very much. It's a woman who was there. She was in her 60s. And um, she wasn't writing, so I went over to see what was going on with her. And she was staring at this piece of art. And there were, there were tears in her eyes. And she was, she was looking at it. And I asked her, what was going on? What was she feeling? And she, she pulled out this 40-some-year-old um, uh a postcard that had this um, this uh, pastel, and it was ratty. It was torn. It was worn. And she said she had been carrying this around since she was in college, because she was one of four sisters, and all of them had had this painting as a postcard, and that she was the only one of the four sisters who was left. And it was such a moment that everyone who was around her, including me, started tearing up. And she had never seen this before. In all of her life, she'd only had that postcard, but she had never seen it before. And it was a very, very, very touching, touching moment. So what wound up happening um, after that, let me see if we can find this here, is I brought all of the works that everyone had written. They had sent works in, to, as Brooke had said, they had put many things up online. They had sent me some, some pieces from their, from their work. And I got to be able to put the work together 
and make a collective poem out of many of the images that were most popularly viewed. This is me and, and, and a musician addressing an audience of people uh, at a museum night where they're, they're actually hearing this. And if I can uh, uh, make this happen, what I will do is let you hear just a little bit of that collective poem which came out of that. From image to image. All right, here we go. Move much too quickly from image to image. You ocularly register colors, objects, body positions, but you do not see them. Not really. Not with your glances, sweeping and dismissive ricochets from frame to frame. Not with your eyes, the black mind, having been CGI'd, Netflix, and neon into a black of looking. Your head, like mine, so wired with electronic noise that noticing nuance means a mind. Yet, something in you heard them speaking across. Okay, so as you can see, let me see if I can get, get us back here. All right. As you can see with that, there was a lot of people there. It's also a lot of noise, but there was a lot of people there. And um, it was really, really a, a great experience for everyone, especially some of the poets who were there and heard their own words coming back to them. So that was my experience with that. A second one uh, that, that I did was um, as Ancient Nubia Now. And this was very different, very different. Instead of me teaching a class, what I got to do with this one was to actually engage directly with the artwork in which the museum, uh, uh, I went to one of the, the exhibitions and saw these particular pieces of artwork, which, every, which so many people were stopping by to check out. I looked at how people reacted to what was going on, what they commented on, how it seemed that it affected them. And, um, and they, were, they were flabbergasted by this. This is, this is King Taharqa. Uh, this right here is Ma'at. This right here is Hathor. And so with, this experience was different in that after I had interacted with the art, had studied the art, had, had also did research into the art, and Brooke and, Brooke and the rest of the MFA were very good at making resources available to me to be able to study what was going on, I was able to then put all of those impressions that I had into a piece of work. And I went and I hired musicians who I thought could help me to bring that across musically. And um, this is uh, the two musicians who you should see over there. That would be um, uh, Thaer Bader. He is the man there who was playing something called the Oud. And next to him is a young woman named Afarin Nazari. And she is playing something called the, uh, the Kanun, which is um, more of a, of a Middle Eastern dulcimer. And here is just a bit of how, of how what it was that we did sounded. You can get a sense of it. It is shrouded the history, covered by Egyptian misrepresentation and European lies. Its narrowed script, untranslatable, all for a new Rosetta Stone, so we can know the ancient movements. But we have no such stone. But we today have what the ancient Nubians had. Mind, mind, imagination. Let's open them all and see ancient Nubia now. Follow the night from us. So, as you can as you can see with that, this was also had um, a larger sonic. Uh, footprint about it that um, 
and it was great. It was great to work with this. We had to be careful though, because we couldn't use anything like drums and especially, especially with the pastels, we couldn't use anything like drums because it's a very soft medium. And some of the museum uh, curators were afraid that, that sonic sounds, um, booms, percussion would, would hurt the artwork itself. And um, some of them also wanted us to make sure that our footprint as far as musicians were very small because we still had to make sure that people could move through and not be disturbed by anything that would be in their way. So with that, um, I would say that if I had to say that there was a drawback, uh, one of them I think Brooks spoke about, which was, which was sound. Sound itself, it is a public space. It is a, it is a um, uh, we do have to work within that. It is gonna be for us a little bit difficult to get people to concentrate, to focus. Um, what was great about it is that even people who just came in to just view the work wound up being participants in the program. They had never expected to do that, but, but they wanted to be a part of it once they saw what was going on. One of the great things that, other great things that I got from it is personally, it helped me to grow not only as an artist, but also as an educator and to also lead people through these exercises, which I had been creating, many of them directly for usage here in the, in the MFA. But previously I'd had a relationship with the MFA because I bring young people there every year from a place called Grub Street. And the MFA has always opened its spaces up to them. And many of those young folks who I've taught have become members of the MFA and now they come there on their own. So I wanna thank the MFA for allowing me to be able to, uh, to apply my trade there and to also be able to do something useful. Great. So um, thank you so much, Reggie. It, it sure. was great to hear, again, your perspective um, on the program and, and what it was like to be an artist in a museum um, from these two different angles, I think, as you said, teaching in the galleries and then um, creating something from the collection in the galleries. Right. Um, so that's sort of the end of our formal presentation. Um, we just Can wanted to here? leave some room for questions if people had them or um, ideas if people wanted to share. We're happy to, to talk um, through those. All right, so this is the point where if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat and I will go ahead and uh, read them out for Reggie and Brooke. Okay, um, Patrick from Plays in Place wants to know if you're planning on doing more of this in the future. Mm -hmm. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> um, the hope is, uh, as I mentioned, the funding was tied to our strategic plan, which um, ends in 2021 um, and um, sort of fiscal year 2021, which which starts for us in, in June of 2020. Um, so music in the galleries will be the final thing at the moment, but um, we feel pretty confident that it's something that we could raise money for um, and find some funding that way. Okay, and we have a no questions, but a big thank you um, from Surya, who runs a poetry program and workshop program. So thanks for the new ideas on how to combine and expand them. You're welcome. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Well, I want to thank you both a lot um, because a I know the tech platform was a bit of a pain when we were trying to get that all figured out initially. Um, so thank you for your great ambition in bringing in, you know, video and everything else. I think mm -hmm. that really contributed. And also big thanks to Brooke. Um, Brooke and I were both down in DC until fairly late yesterday um, on Capitol Hill talking about why museums are awesome and we're both exhausted. So thank you very much Man. Um, for Man. stepping up to the plate today. Oh, hey, I see, I see somebody, did, are there more questions or are we done? Yes, we do have one more question here. It says, sure. do you have any suggestions on how to duplicate this in a smaller community and gallery? Yeah, so um, I think, I mean, I think very much it's scalable. It's one of the reasons why when Meg asked me to do this, um, I agreed because I feel like, you know, we did it sort of one way. We had three poets, we worked with mass poetry. Um, you know, we, we had a, a fair amount of funding, but, um, but I do think you can kind of tailor it to, to what's um, possible within your galleries and your resources, um, you know, maybe just working with one outside poet or, um, you know, working with a, 
a university, um, you know, might help keep the cost down a little bit too. Um, or, you know, we did it every single week, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's only done um, once a week or you charge for it. Um, so <clears throat> I think there are, are a lot of ways to, to kind of fit it to, to what's a, possible for you um right. I understand that not everyone is the mfa um and but i think it you know it's definitely very very scalable i will also say as an artist um i could have done that anywhere mm -hmm. um i could do i could what i did for the mfa is not strictly it was of course w written with the uh, though these exercises were made directly according to uh, what was the art i had to interact with and what i knew were the resources but i could have done this in a single room with with the with 12 people yeah. so i did not need to have all of that i'm glad i had it of course but i didn't need that at all and and this is something that is easily replicable in in another space absolutely it is both as a matter of fact both of, of what i presented whether it was the teaching or whether it was being left with the art and then coming up with something absolutely could have been done anywhere yeah, and I don't know if I had a chance to mention, I think it was on my slides, but you know, our supplies were very simple. We just mm -hmm. gave people paper and pencils yeah. and a clipboard, um, you know, yeah. so that was really easy um, and didn't cost a lot at all. All right, we do have one more question about where the funding came from. I know you said it was tied to your strategic plan. Was that something that the MFA had just set aside in their budget or was there external funding for that in addition? It was, so there was um, external funding overall for the strategic plan. It was um, kind of a fundraising initiative for our development department um, in general. There are many programs attached to the strategic plan. And so um, we got kind of a, a small pot of money that, that came in from, from that strategic plan funding. Okay, do we have any last questions for our presenters? We have a little more time, so I'm not trying to rush anybody off. Um, just wanted to check in would you do something different to manage the sound issues mm, that's a good question so all of my programs take place in the galleries um, and that is often an issue um, I think you know for Reggie's late night performance we did a microphone um, mm -hmm. and so that really helped it did. But we kind of shied away from that for the regular um, ongoing programs because we didn't want it to um, disturb visitors who are just there looking at the art. Um, so it, it, it kind of became something that the poets just had to deal with and they very kindly did. Right. <laughs> um, but I, I recognize it's not ideal um, right. to balance multiple things happening in, in one space. Yeah. yeah. It might be different. It might be different for people who let's say you have an educator who has a smaller voice. Mm -hmm. Right, um, a space like like the MFA would that would be that would be problematic for an individual who had a smaller voice. I also think um, it probably uh, in smaller spaces it wouldn't be as as much of an issue. It's not only just that the MFA has larger rooms, but the larger rooms, of course, they have a, a different sound uh, print. Right, so you have all of this this um, <clears throat> echoing and re and and resonance and reverb and all of that, which mm -hmm. makes it difficult for people for people to focus and to hear as well. But in smaller places that don't have as many hard surfaces or as high ceilings, it shouldn't be as much of a problem. And I've done things like this in a historic house, and we didn't really have sound issues at right. all. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I would add, you know, all of this went into um, selecting who the poets were. So, um, you know, so if you are going to replicate this program, thinking about, you know, sort of what what are your challenges, what are your opportunities, what's the um, environment like, and and so we were very clear with Mass Poetry when when we engaged them and asked them to find poets for us that, you know, this is going to be in a space that you know that's not a classroom. You're going to have to deal with drop-in visitors. You're going to have to deal with sound issues. Um, you know. We mm -hmm. kind of equated it to sort of like a cooking show where, you know, you have to maybe like redo your speech a couple times because you have new people coming in and coming out. And so, and to Reggie's point, you know, someone who can really command a space. Um, and so all of that kind of went into the mix of who they selected um, and who they asked for poets. So I, I would think about that, you know, what are the components that are important um, so that you make sure you, you pick a person who, you know, you set up for success um, within whatever constraints your spaces have. We do have another question um, regarding the marketing and the mm -hmm. fact that you said you wished you had done more. Do you have like one particular additional marketing strategy you'd use if you were doing something similar in the future? 
a good question. I mean, I think I would definitely ask the poets to reach out to their networks, um, you know, because that, you know, as you saw on the, the survey slide, that's one of the reasons people came was to see the particular poets that, that we were working with. So um, definitely ask them to sort of, um, you know, use their networks a little bit more. Um, I think for, for the museum, um, you know, maybe highlighting a little bit more on our website. Sometimes our website's a little hard to navigate through <laughs> and find things. Um, so if there's, if there's a way to, um, you know, really have it come to the forefront more, because there is so much happening at the museum, I think sometimes individual programs can kind of get a little bit lost. Yeah, I think we also have to think about how much can each room really accommodate? Yeah, that's true. Right, you know, because um, I think maybe I had what an average of 40 people maybe it was 40 uh -huh. folks or whatever yeah. you know had it been 75 people right. Right. In, in a room you know if i'd have talked to more students then then can people then could could the patrons really move through to be able to yeah. to see the artwork right so i think we have yep. to keep that in mind too we don't want to oversell it right right that's a good point all right any other final questions for folks Brooke and Reggie, did any of those questions shake loose? Any final thoughts you wanted to share with folks? <laughs> yeah, I think for me, just again, reiterating, you know, how scalable this is and, you know, and to Reggie's point, you know, um, you know, feeling like he, he could have done this in, in a smaller place, in a different place. Um, it's, it's a program that, um, you know, takes talent, obviously, um, to kind of engage visitors and, and to get them looking and thinking and writing. Um, but it doesn't take a lot of like materials. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it is very doable and no matter where you are. Okay, final question. Um, would you be able to share the pie chart of how participants heard about the program? And I believe you both said you would be willing to share your slides and we'll put them up on the yeah. NEMA website yeah. for people. So Thank those will be up tomorrow. Uh, for anyone who wants to be able to either, we've been recording this so you can come back and listen again and we will also have the slides available. Mm -hmm. So again, sure. our tech guru Heather is out of the office today so those will be up tomorrow. And I'm sorry, Reggie, I think I interrupted you when Meg asked for last words, did you? No, 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 no. no okay. 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 All right, thank you both and thank you all sure. for being yeah. here with us today Absolutely. and we um, have lunch with Nima last Wednesday of every month. So please come back and join us again. Thank and you. thank you so much. Yeah, and if you, you do all. some poetry, let us know. <laughs> Send us an email. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Later, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.